that introduction, Atai. I am Jacqueline Melanick. I am the co-founder of Token Relations, and I am joined with the CEO of Ripple, Brad Garlinghouse. As many of you know, Ripple had an ongoing case with the SEC that lasted three, maybe four years, Almost depending four, on who yeah. you ask. Yeah, and essentially, they were in and out of the headlines from December 2020 to now, right. <laughs> always in the headlines, and essentially Ripple scored a win against the SEC, and it determined that XRP is not a security, which is huge. I think it's not just important for Ripple, it's not just important for the XRP community, it's also important for, as we were introduced, the, the crypto industry at large. Yeah, I mean, the good news is there's a lot of countries around the world that have leaned into providing clear rules of the road for crypto. The United States is not an example of that, unfortunately. And the U.S. is the largest economy, but uh, it was super important, I think, to set the precedent for the crypto industry at large that just because it's a token does not mean it's a security, which was kind of the approach the U.S. SEC was taking. So uh, we feel really good about it. and. I think there's going to be more wins. Uh, Kraken just scored a win in the United States uh, a week or two ago, and uh, I think we'll, we'll eventually get to a better place. Yeah, and we'll definitely talk about the other cases going on with the SEC, but aside from the initial $2 billion price tag that they wanted to give Ripple, uh, which was reduced by like 94%, what made Ripple really want to go all in and be like, we are going to fight this, it's not okay? You know, it, I think it's an important question, and actually one of the things I would challenge other companies that are being attacked by the SEC, that there aren't that many companies that actually can stand up to a bully. And the SEC has a lot of power, and it takes a lot of money and a lot of conviction to fight that. But we, we really did, from the very, very beginning, believe that we were on the right side of the law and that we'd be on the right side of history. And to some degree, the industry needed people to step up to the bully. And you know it's just really frustrating because in the case of Ripple and the case of other cases the SEC has tried to prosecute, there aren't victims. No one lost money. So they're, they're actually going after things for reasons that you're like, wait, like, what's your end goal here? The goal of the United States SEC, the mission statement starts with to protect investors. And you're seeing more often now them going after things like, okay, no one lost money, but you say you're protecting investors. What's really going on? And it, it is, think I think, is political. On? Okay. I think it, it, there are some politics at play in the United States, and I think Gary Gensler, the chairman of the SEC, has been you know, more focused on power than he has on sound policy. And I think that's starting to change, and I think you know, he really has hurt the, the, his party. He's a Democrat. And I think it's, it's hurt them in the, the, the current election cycle, and uh, we'll, we'll obviously see how that plays out. I know we are in Korea right now, but the U.S. is having their presidential election this fall. What kind of role do you think that will play and impact on the crypto industry there? Well, look, I think no matter who wins in the United States, I think we'll see new leadership at the United States SEC. So I think that's good. That's good for crypto. I think that's good for the United States. Uh, you know, I, I think you clearly have seen in the United States, crypto has become slightly political and slightly partisan, where re the Republicans have kind of leaned in more so than the Democrats. I don't really get that. Uh, why a party would be for or against a technology doesn't really make sense. It's kind of like saying, well, the Democrats are against TCP IP, but the Republicans are for it. You know, typically, people are for or against how technologies are used. And yes, many technologies can be used to great benefit to society, and sometimes technologies can be used in negative ways. And th the goal, I think, should be let's regulate to make sure that we're not using these technologies in bad ways. But it's bizarre to me that some Democrats have come, come out and said, you know, crypto is just bad. It's like, well, that's like saying email is bad. That's like saying the web is bad. I'm sure there was someone who said that back yeah. in the early 2000s. Yeah. <laughs> well, well, it's an interesting comparison. I mean, I, I first got involved in the internet back in 1997, and there were people in the earliest days of the web that were like, it's bad. And, you know, look, you, you, it, it's not wrong, of course, that technologies, new technologies can and will be used in ways that are not good. Mm -hmm. That's been true in the history of time. It'll continue to be true. The challenge, I think, for everyone here, particularly at a Korean blockchain week, is how do we use these technologies 
to make transactions more efficient, to make business more efficient, to make consumer experiences more efficient, to make banking more efficient. There's so many examples where decentralization can actually help that you know, we need to unlock further and show, as the last speaker actually was talking about, show examples of how we're actually helping and these technologies are helping that will, I think, further unlock adoption. Yeah, and I wanna talk about <clears throat> Uh, ripples, you know, enterprise businesses, payments, et cetera. But before we go over there, how do you kind of view the other cases with the SEC in regards to other crypto entities? You talked about Kraken. There was the one that just recently was announced, the Wells Notice for OpenSea. There's a lot of different ones out there that, honestly, I'm a former reporter, and I became almost a legal reporter covering all of this. And when the OpenSea one happened, I kind of like, rolled my eyes because this, it just feels like it's one after another. So how are you viewing it as someone who like went through the ringer and now you're on the outside? You know, w when Gary Gensler took over the SEC uh, you know, three years ago or so, one of the first things he did is he asked for more budget to hire more enforcement lawyers. Now you think about that. Okay, so instead of taking the time to write laws and to codify, here's how regulation should work for crypto, he took the approach of, we're gonna go sue some more people. Mm -hmm. And it, you know, look, that's not a good way to create sound regulation and sound policy. And sure enough, those lawsuits have actually added confusion to the system. And there's sometimes the SEC has taken the position that something's a security, there's sometimes they've taken a position that it's not. And you've had judges really go after them. Uh, you know, in some of the ETF ruling, uh, the, the judge wrote, this is a quote, said that the SEC was being arbitrary and capricious. Now, uh, you know, I this is pretty insulting to an organization that is supposed to work for the people. Like, we forget, like, th these are government organizations that are supposed to work for the people. And I think many of them lost sight of that as, uh, I think the SEC kind of lost sight of that. So the, the case against OpenSea, look, you know, they're, they're taking the position that NFTs are securities. You know, the, there's already been case law about how art, meaning traditional art, is not. And that just because it might, someone might speculate on the price of a piece of art, that it might go up, that doesn't make it a security. And so look, I, I think they have a losing case and I think it's really unfortunate for OpenSea because look, Ripple spent over 150 million US dollars defending ourselves. Not every company can do that. And so I, I don't know OpenSea well, I, I respect the leadership there, and I hope they're in a position where they can fight this fight because you know, the, the, the SEC is bullying people, and I think it does set you know, a, a dangerous precedent for other governments around the world. And so I always try to highlight countries like the United Kingdom, countries like Japan, countries like Singapore, countries like Switzerland, that really have invested the time and energy to provide clear rules of the road because I think as you and I both have experienced, most people in crypto want to follow the rules of the road. We just need to know where the rules are. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and the bad actors will be shaken out eventually. For sure. I mean, look, one of the ironies is FTX and Sam Bankman fried You read my mind. That yeah. <laughs> was one of the ones I, I mean, talked about. Yeah. That set the industry back, for sure. Uh, and you know, the people say, well, it's the Wild West and there aren't laws. Sam's in jail. There are laws, and they were applied, and I think, you know, he did some things he shouldn't have done. Maybe that was out of, you know, naivete, maybe that was out of maliciousness, I don't know. But the, the idea that this is the, the Wild West, I think, is just, that's not the real world. No, no, we, we live in a reality with laws. We do, and a <laughs> lot of those laws are here in Korea, Japan, across a Asia Pacific. I mean, look, one of the uh, Ripple's largest offices is in Singapore. And the reason is that there's clear rules of the road. We've worked with the Metro, Metro excuse me, the, the Ma MAS, the uh, Monetary Authority of Singapore, to we have licensing there. We we're regulated by MAS, and I think that's a very appropriate way for us to grow the industry. We're willing to invest the time and energy and money to get the licensing. But again, there's some jurisdictions like the United States that instead of providing those rules, but one last thought on this, if people are following this closely. The good news is there are legislative efforts and an important piece of legislation passed the US House of Representatives uh, in July, I think, or maybe it was June, called the FIT 21 Act. Uh, FIT stands for Financial Inclusion, I don't remember. 
But it, it is a market structure bill that provides clarity for crypto. It now has to go through the Senate, and it's hard to predict in an election year how that will play out. But I'm actually optimistic we may finally get legislative clarity, again, not from the leadership of the SEC, which one would expect, but from our elected officials uh, finally listening to the people that they represent. I know you spent a lot of time in DC. You just talked about something like that. Um, what are they saying internally? <laughs> Tell us what's happening. <laughs> so I've definitely spent a lot of time uh, and Ripple partnered with Coinbase and Andreessen Horowitz in creating a what's called a political action committee to help elect people who are pro-innovation and pro-crypto. And I think that has had a big impact in helping crypto uh, elevate on the radar of our elected officials in the United States. I mean, it's of course unfortunate we have to do those things to have, the group is called Fair Shake. That's an appropriate, it, it's to get a fair shake. Uh, and you know, I think the, the topic is much more important. I went to the Democratic National Convention in Chicago a couple weeks ago, and before that to the Republican National Convention in Milwaukee. And you know, people, it's on the radar. And I think we're seeing movement on both sides of the aisle to you know, provide that legislative clarity. I will tell you without any reservation, Gary Gensler is not a popular figure on either side of the aisle. And you know, I, I heard that loud and clear at the Democratic National Convention. I heard that loud and clear at the Republican National Convention. And, you, he, and when he goes and testifies before Congress, you see a lot of hostility from both sides of the aisle in terms of how he has approached his position at the SEC. Who do you think will be next then? Do you have any ideas? Who are you gonna vote for? I, I haven't decided yet. <laughs> <laughs> I, I'm not making any news today. Uh, I, look, I, I think it is a, it's gonna be an interesting election for sure. It's gonna be very close. Uh, I don't know what the right answer is. Uh, okay, okay. Th there's, there's pluses and minuses on both sides, I think. That's fair. Uh, have you had a vacation since all of this has happened? Uh, well, the past after, three, four years of work? I, I have tried, I mean, when the decision came out, when uh, Ripple won the case and they declared that XRP is not a security, uh, I definitely took some time and with some friends uh, to celebrate a bit and, you know, with my kids. Uh, so I think you do have to kind of step back and appreciate some of the, the wins along the way. And I, I think it applies to all, uh, entrepreneurship and building companies in the crypto space is hard. And there's a, a lot of obstacles. And I think you do have to, every once in a while, uh, appreciate and take stock of the good things along the way. Um, with the resolution of the lawsuit now you know, coming to fruition, we talked about, before we got on stage, that majority of Ripple's users are actually outside the US. But do you kind of see maybe the opportunity for IPOing in the US? It's a good question. I mean, it, uh, it, as Jacqueline's described, about 95% of Ripple's customers, and these are banks, financial institutions, payment providers, uh, even on the, the, the custody side of our business, it expands a little bit beyond that, but about 95% of our customers are outside the United States. And part of that is because when you have a lawsuit from a regulator like the SEC, it freezes the market and people are like, whoa, I'm not gonna touch this. Now, after we've won the case, one would think that might unlock the market. The reality is the US government remains pretty hostile towards crypto in general. And you know the, uh, the SEC approved Coinbase going public in the United States, and now the SEC is suing Coinbase for the same things they approved in their what's called an S1 in the United States. So uh, I have no interest in being public in the United States right now, none. Okay. <laughs> uh, <laughs> well, Eventually, maybe we'll cross that bridge, but uh, for now, you know, I, I'm not really popular at the SEC. Mm -hmm. uh, Gary Gensler is a big fan of mine. You're a headache. I'm a headache, for sure. <laughs> and I'm gonna keep being a headache. I mean, like, it's not that I but try to- But it benefited the industry in the end. So. I, by the way, that's really important. Like, I, I think we need people who are going to speak truth to power when the power is not following even the law. I mean, Gary Gensler goes out and talks about some, an ex, he used an expression called a digital asset security. That is not a legal term. That doesn't exist. But he made it one. No, I'm kidding. Well, I, I'll also tell you, uh, you know, that maybe more news to come on this, but Gary Gensler also has gone out to say, this is a quote, the leading lights of crypto in the United States are either in jail, going to jail, or being extradited to go to jail. 
Okay, now, is this an objective view of an industry, or is this a guy who's just decided every actor in this space is a bad actor? It's called defamation. Yeah, that's not good. And I mean, that means everyone in this room is screwed. <laughs> <laughs> well, Which is well, not the case. Well, I will say, <laughs> well, I mean, one of the first, yeah. you and I obviously both hail from the United States, but one of the first pieces of advice I give entrepreneurs who ask me about starting crypto companies is don't incorporate in the United States. You're just asking for more legal bills. Incorporate in a jurisdiction that has clear rules of the road. Singapore is great. Switzerland's great. The UK is great. Japan is great. There's a lot of good answers. It just happens to be the United States is not one of them. Yeah, yeah, that's a, it's a bummer, given that we were both Americans. But maybe things will change next time we talk. Um, I want to talk about Ripple and your business, the, well, the company, everything, enterprise business, payments, custodying, everything, and the new stablecoin that's going to be launched as well soon. Where are you seeing the most demand right now internally in terms of all of these products and services? So we have always tried to focus on the highest friction points. So you know, cross-border payments in particular, trying to get money into and out of various currencies and across borders has always been you know, a point of high friction. Obviously, some people will adopt crypto and just buy crypto and move it, but that's hard for a lot of people. So our goal has always been to work with banks, we work with payment providers so that we can actually make that faster and cheaper and, and frankly simpler. So we started with just cross-border payments. We acquired a custody company last summer out of Switzerland and now we have a Ripple custody business that has certainly grown quickly that has some of the largest banks in the world. HSBC is an example of a customer there. Uh, and then as you mentioned, we're in the process of launching a new stablecoin. And look, I, I think the stablecoin market is exciting and obviously has grown. We're at about $170 billion market today. Some have forecasted it to be $2 trillion in five years. Uh, it, you know, Ripple already was using stablecoins in our payment flows with our customers. And there was a time when we were represent that Ripple was minting 20% of all USDC. And so we felt like, look, it only makes sense Obviously, there was a big event last spring in the United States, I mean, a year, 18 months ago, where uh, USDC depegged, and we felt like there was an opportunity for a credible player that's already working with lots of financial institutions to lean into that market. So we're very close to launching that. And look, the last thing I'll say about this, Ripple has always, because we're in the payments business from our, from our origins, We've always been a compliance first company. We've always been a, we need to work with regulators. We need to work, make sure we have licensing in place. And we think there's an opportunity for uh, another player in the stablecoin market to exist that focuses on institutions, focuses on a compliance first point of view. You said it's gonna launch soon. Can we get an idea of when? Uh, well, we're, we're in a private kind of closed beta, so we, we are live in that it, RL, it's called Ripple USD, RLUSD have been minted in that framework. We will certainly launch uh, soon, uh, weeks, not months. Okay, that's a, that's a good estimate, weeks. Better than months, not years. Yes. Yeah. Regionally speaking, uh, we talked a lot about the U.S. We are in Korea right now. Where are you seeing the most demand right now, maybe in the Asian market? What are the trends that you're following here and talking about while you're in town? Well, I mean, part of the reason I'm here is because Asia Pacific and specifically Korea has been such a leader and it, it, the enthusiasm around these technologies has been so high. So uh, we've had a, a vibrant business in the region. We announced a couple things. One, we are working with a, uh, a number of local universities, most recently Yonsei, where we are actually sponsoring research and education around crypto and blockchain. And again, not just about XRP, but about crypto broadly. Uh, my experience has been if crypto does well, Ripple's going to do well also. And so we wanna see all boats rise with that tide. Uh, we also announced a Korea-Japan investment fund and we're providing grants for developers working on the XRP ledger. Uh, just this past weekend, we had a, a hackathon here in Seoul. Uh, we've had great participation, a lot of activity. So we, we're doubling down in this region, and uh, we, we will continue to do so. That's wonderful. And I think one of the last major questions I have for you, Brad, is oftentimes I hear that regulation, need for frameworks, et cetera, is something that inhibits institutions from entering the space. And I'm sure you're nodding your head. You see the same. What do you think is needed to move the industry forward from a global perspective? I mean, I, I literally think the number one issue to move the industry forward is that regulatory clarity on a global scale. 
you know, I know that the FSC here in Korea is looking at some rules uh, that are apparently will be evaluated in the first half of 2025. Certainly the U.S. seeing legislative movement there. But I, I think what's holding back the unlock in a lot of places is if we don't have regulatory clarity, you're going to continue to have financial institutions that are afraid to do this. And uh, it, it, when that fear exists, they can't lean in aggressively. And so I'm very optimistic. Look, I'm more optimistic now about the next five years of crypto than I've ever been. That's exciting. What about the next five years in Ripple? What are you excited about? Or at least let's do 2025. Let's start there. 2025, well, look, obviously, we're entering a new uh, business line with our stablecoin. You know, custody has continued to grow. We certainly think that the core of our business around cross-border payments has continued to grow and adding more customers globally. So, look, we're almost 1,000 employees uh, and quite optimistic about you know, continuing to grow there. But again, I, I really do focus on, I want crypto to win. The tribalism that has infected crypto over the past you know, five years, I think, is starting to go away. I want, I'm, I'm bullish on so many projects. Ripple has invested hundreds of millions of dollars in other crypto projects. We will continue to do that because we think if crypto wins, we're all gonna win. I love that. Lastly, can you leave us with a piece of advice? This is something I ask all my guests on my podcast and this feels like one, so. Put uh, that's on a, I didn't see that coming. Uh, piece of advice, let's see. You know, one of my favorite pieces of advice in life has uh, this expression of take the professor, not the class. And I think that applies to jobs, you know, it applies to school, and that people uh, should go find people they love working with, either in school or in professional situations. And your, your career, you get to work with an amazing guy in Anthony Pompilano, and I think you know, working with great people elevates everybody. And I think that's true in all parts of your life. Amazing. I love that. Brad, thank you so much for taking the time to talk, and thank you to everyone for listening in. Thank you. All right. Perfect. Um, yeah, that was a great session. And again, as a...